I would like to introduce you back to Ray Stott, who will be our chair for, for this panel. Um, Ray, I'll leave it to you to introduce all of our uh, panelists today. We've got two virtual three in person. Stage is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again to Space 4.0. We're going to be talking about accelerating and simplifying research and development and how that affects manufacturing in the space sector. And I'd like to welcome uh, our panel of five today, a uh, very eclectic panel. So first of all, we have Steve Radar, who is a uh, virtual. Nice to see you, Steve. Uh, he is a project manager at the NASA Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation, and he's joining us online. Uh, can we just check the mic for you, uh, Steve? Sure, absolutely. Hi. Nice, nice to, to see you. Good. And also um, on uh, virtual, we have Scott Bryson, uh, who's the founder of Orbital Farm. Uh, hi, Scott. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. And whereabouts are you calling from today, Scott? I'm uh, in Toronto in Canada. In Toronto. So and uh, just to be clear, where are you calling from, Steve? Uh, I'm in Houston, Texas. In Houston. There you go. So we have Houston and Toronto. So welcome to our colleagues in Houston, Toronto. And on the stage, we have uh, our two uh, other panelists. Uh, very welcome uh, on board. Uh, we have Dr. Peter Shaw. Peter, welcome. Senior lecturer in astronautics at Kingston University here in the UK. Welcome on board. Thank you very much for inviting us. And also we have Daniel Carew, if I pronounce that correctly. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he's a principal at IQ Capital. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Excellent. So today, um, let's talk about accelerating space 4.0. Well, we're just going to take a step back because 4.0, 2.0, they're all terms that we hear a lot in industry. 1.0, what do they all mean? So maybe I can um, just, um, after we do a brief introduction, we're going to finalize what actually 4.0 actually means. So, before we do that, let's um, just have a brief introduction of a minute for each everyone um, on who you are and what you're doing in the space industry at the moment. So over to you on the stage, uh, we have Dr. Peter Shaw. Um, hi, thanks. Uh, so yeah, senior lecturer at Kingston University. Um, I've had about 15 years in the space industry, um, 10 of that in uh, academia, either working as a research assistant on advanced propulsion, uh, electric propulsion systems, um, or, um, and recently three years at Kingston um, in astronautics um, with a, a focus on access to space uh, sort of technology, so launches, spaceports, uh, etc. Um, I did five years in industry working for SSTL, um, and uh, claim to fame is I've got four propulsion systems currently working in space, so wow. happy about that. That's awesome. Uh, over to you, Daniel, Daniel Carew. Yeah, hi everyone. So my name is Daniel. Uh, I started off as an engineer uh, in Toronto actually, uh, focused on materials and, and aerospace. I uh, went and did a PhD in, in the UK around, again, chemistry and materials. Spent some time in management consulting before I started Venture. Um, I uh, was at Seraphim for, for a few years when the Space Space Fund was first, uh, first raised. Uh, and then I moved to IQ Capital. IQ Capital is a deep tech fund in the UK. Uh, we focus on, uh, well, investments uh, in seed Series A in, in the UK and, and the EU, a few, few further afield. Uh, and we really focus on like that underlying underlying technology. Uh, so what the, the tech breakthrough is. So you know we invest in new types of AI, new robotics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So currently I sit on the boards of uh, New Quantum, which is a quantum communications um, uh, startup, which has applications to space. I sit on the board of Opteron, which take like um, yeah actually the neuromorphic patterns from bees and put them into silicon. So you get uh, something which can navigate drones using an FPGA, which is pretty, really cool and difficult. <laughs> so replacing kind of all of the, you know, uh, deep learning and type networks that, you know, cost a lot, uh, et cetera. And I also sit on the board of Oxford Space Systems, uh, which uh, here in the UK, we manufacture antennas for uh, small and, and large size uh, satellites. So as you can see, we have a multi-talented crew and a Daniel Carew as well. So thank you, Daniel, for that <laughs> amazing uh, uh, group. Uh, Scott Bryson, we have uh, over to you in Canada. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm, hi, everyone. I'm Scott Bryson from Orbital Farm. Uh, 
I started Orbital Farm three and a half years ago. What we are doing is developing commercial scale projects here in Earth to pilot and develop technologies for life support systems that can support human habitation in space. And so we're tying together the integration of energy, water, and technologies, and greenhouse systems, and waste management into a complete large scale system. And trying to build and develop projects here on Earth to impact food security, climate change, waste utilization, um, and and take those actions here on Earth and build a network of platforms that can give us a long term testing and capability for understanding the integrations, understanding where failures happen, understanding where you know best use case technologies are, and, and allowing different countries to participate in the the, the development of space technologies. Practically here on Earth, and there's a long term application in space in the future. So we spent a lot of time thinking of you know, the dual use of space and Earth, and we, we, we take a look at a lot of water utilization and, and early applications in space uh, with regards to water depots and um, you know, the, the thinking around the, the technology that ultimately will function and work in those areas and what it's going to take to prove that at large, large commercial scale. Uh, here on Earth. So thank you very much for having me. That's awesome. Uh, Scott, thank you very much. So we have our definitely our Canadian space farmer with us as well. Uh, so over to you. Um, we have Steve. Apologies, Steve. Just checking up, make sure I get the name. Steve Rader. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. No worries. Sure. Uh, so I also, like uh, Daniel, uh, started as an engineer about a little over 30 years ago at NASA. And uh, in that time, I've worked in mission control and flight software development, uh, doing delay tolerant networking protocols. Uh, I was the lead architect for the command communications and control and information architecture for Constellation. And uh, more recently, I am the program manager for our center of excellence for collaborative innovation. Uh, and that is a center of excellence that works across NASA, as well as the entire federal government uh, to help programs and projects really start to deal with this rapid change in technology uh, and the pace of change by using open innovation. So that's crowdsource challenges, uh, using uh, existing curated crowds, as well as uh, labor platforms like uh, Freelancer or Optal, uh, those kinds of platforms. And we have access to about 40 different crowdsource communities that represent about 120 million people worldwide and have done about 600 uh, projects with the crowd uh, to actually advance spaceflight as well as other portions of the government. So it's kind of an exciting time. Excellent, Steve. Thank you very much for that overview. And uh, finally, myself, Ray Stock from Space Specialists. Uh, we provide recruitment, training, and consulting to the global space industry. We have an office in the UK, in the Northwest, in Cheshire, and also in Adelaide, down under in South Australia. And we're very happy to uh, support the event today. And uh, if you need any help in uh, those areas, just uh, get in touch. Um, my fortunate is that I've spent 30 years in the business uh, building and testing satellites. So my sort of uh, levels of expertise are environmental testing of satellites, whether it be satellite constellations or the, the big geostationary birds, uh, but also space robotics on the International Space Station and more recently uh, environmental testing of the GPS satellite Galileo that was uh, recently uh, uh, delivered through to the European uh, Commission. So uh, that's my background. Okay, so we we'll talk about Space 4.0. Um, what is Space 4.0? I've heard of Space 1.0. I've got an interesting frown from uh, our doctor here from uh, the University uh, at Kingston. I'm going to put you on the spot. What is Space 4.0 to you? Oh, well, okay, so 4.0 is, uh, it, well, it's, it's one of those terms bandied around the, um, the space industry for the last few years. And it means very different things to, to very different people. Um, you know, talk to my students, um, and they think it's just, you know, collaboration um, and uh, everything which 
pretty much the space industry has been doing uh, for the last 20 years. Um, but I think you know, a lot of people in this room kind of probably realize that space 4.0 to them is, is more kind of this, this new nuance of, of privatization and getting space into, into SME space companies and really driving that commercial aspect, which is, uh, you know, uh, you know, not new to the people who are here, um, but um, but might be new to the to, to our outside audiences and so on. So, really interesting, really exciting. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm going to pass over to you, Scott. You're developing a orbital space farm. Does that come under Space 4.0 for you? I think so. So, you know, the way that I think about where we're at today in in space um, and what that evolution looks like, uh, I think Space 4.0 once we've already begun commercial activities and operating in space and there are economies operating, um, which is really at the point when large scale lift support systems are going to be necessary. So today, you know, we're not spending our time launching satellite salads in, in space because there's about six astronauts on the International Space Station and we've already got food. Um, once we have a settlement and, and and a constant presence in space, that's really when ISRE technology really becomes viable and useful um, and economically viable. And that's really, that once we begin to yeah, pivot into um, in situ direct utilization or ISRE, that's really to me get to this, this next leap of, of space 4.0. Well, thanks for that insight. And just for those of you who are not used to the space industry, we're full of acronyms. So ISRU is in situ resource utilization. It's a common buzzword that is used at the moment for basically living off the land and developing resources either on the moon or on a planetary body or things like Mars. So you'll hear that term a lot. Uh, Daniel, what are your thoughts on Space 4.0? <clears throat> yeah, for, for me, uh, it's, it's a couple different things. Um, you know, as uh, Peter just picked up on, um, you know, for me, it's the repeatability and, and the commercialization. So, you know, historically, governments, everything was cost plus. So, you know, primes delivered projects cost plus. They, you know, said this is how much it costs, and they owe us a little bit, a little bit more. Whereas now, the business, you know, there's a commercial business case, um, and that that implies that you know you're capturing some sort of value, which is calculated from some commercial equation, and then you know it's no longer a cost plus equation. I, I also think the other bit is that there's some sort of repeatability. Uh, so many of the the new space things or space 4.0 for me it's kind of the the repro or the reproduction of what were formerly government services so you could look at you know low earth tracking uh, which you know the US has has a fantastic sort of and, and Steve you know probably built part of it around communicating with uh, you know lots of the missions but now you've got people like Leo labs who are tracking stuff um, and they've got radars all around the, the world and and so on and I think and then on the constellation perspective you've got a different architecture right you no longer have sort of big individual satellites but you know a whole a whole number of satellites which together form a system which have a different architecture and each one of those is repeatable and and, and so on so it's to me that sort of leads to the, the repeatability -ness of industry 4.0 as well which you see on the ground thanks very much for that uh, insight and uh, uh, d um, I always get this wrong my apologies um, Steve apologies Steve over to you Steve <laughs> It's one of those hard to pronounce names. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, this is a really interesting area because there's a lot going on here. Um, I think one is this increased access to space, right? Lower launch costs, uh, people actually going up in the commercial area. Um, and, and that access to space along with cheaper uh, form factors for satellites and technology where it's more affordable and easier to get technology to space. It's kind of the backbone of all of this. For NASA, you know, we're moving out of the, the building that risk base up and handing it off to, to commercial to now Artemis program going, uh, outside of low Earth orbit and going to the next high risk area of living uh, on the, the moon and ultimately on Mars. And so our focus is actually in the exploration range. And throughout all of this, we're trying to make sure that we're adjusting, not just on the space 4.0 piece, but really what's happening in the rest of the business world, which there are huge seismic shifts going on because the rate of change in technology has grown to such a pace that 
industry is just having a hard time keeping up the expertise, finding the technology in this huge mushroom cloud of technology. Uh, and that's where our group is focused. We're really trying to, to make sure we understand how do we access folks as they're more and more in the gig economy and experts are harder to find and how are we going to find those technologies, especially with as much startup work that's going on in the space uh, arena. It's, it's a whole new area. And we're trying to figure out how do we make all those connections so that we create the kinds of ecosystems that can make uh, the rest of this work. Excellent insight. So here we're hearing a few things that we'll touch on later in the talk, actually. You know, this rate of change of technology, how do we keep up with that? How do we track that? But also, because Space 4.0 is that melting pot of innovation that you've just described very well, obviously the rate of change will be dynamic and we need to be able to adapt and listen to it. And just out of interest... I'm not sure if anybody in the audience or online, maybe there is somewhere a definition of Space 4.0. Maybe there is a Wikipedia or something out there. Could, could be kind of useful to know what we're talking about because everybody uses the term. And you've heard some interesting uh, angles there from our uh, panel uh, globally. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, we're talking about the uh, impact of this rate of change. I'd just like to touch on a thing that we, th we think we talk about pretty much every day, actually, the skills gap. There seems to be a skills gap. And that skills gap's not just in our sector, it's across a whole number of sectors. Um, so Scott, let me just pose to you, what, does the, what are the problems of uh, the skills gap that you see in the current developing technology areas, especially in research and development? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So life support system groups have been very niche focused. So there are very few between uh, companies, let alone people that even work at those companies, um, that, that have knowledge of how to support system function. The good thing is that the technology is used outside of the aerospace sector. So the space industry is used in the aerospace sector, in aircraft, and in uh, the in submarines, for example, this is a critical component of technology. We've got a lot of different analogs um, in in the technology space to talk to talent and talent. Um, we also can draw on people from the controlled environment agriculture sector. And it's really been a, a deep emerging sector globally, um, but it still is incredibly constrained talent. So access to people that have experience, have knowledge of all the components. The life support system section of how you enable space settlement, I think probably more complex than even in the launch sector because of the number of individual components of technology that to be integrated and working together, th this is an exponential level of complexity and you can have cascading failure drop in the whole system. Um, and, and so it requires a huge variety of depth of knowledge that goes from energy and maintaining stable energy systems, fuel production systems, and water storage, sanitation, and food safety, and air, and it, it, it's it's really wide. So, to Stephen's point earlier, having a diverse set of professionals and experts is really critical for us here. Um, but you know, we are seeing certainly a lot of interest uh, publicly with, with NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, putting out challenges in in developing technology in food and space. Uh, we, there, there's a huge application that can go towards, which is fantastic to start building that and there are even programs that have been going on in the 1990s to even here in Canada where they're they're bringing seeds that have been up to space and allowing that in school programs for it's called tomato spear for example they're they're really allowing kids to even plant seeds that they care what you know tomato seeds look different to has gone to space and what are those genetic differences. So you, we're, we've been seeding that for a long time excuse the pun um, but, you know, that, that needs to happen more, and it needs to happen in many other countries and many other places. And, and, and so, yeah, more and more and more. Thanks for that analysis, and we love puns on this panel. Um, so that's the sort of North America view. What's happening in the UK? Um, so do you think that's different, the uh, skills gap in the UK, especially from a university angle? What are you, what are you seeing? What's the 
the litmus test of the skills gap at the moment at well, your university? It, it kind of goes back to, to what we were talking about, about the rate of change. Um, now, if you roll back a few years, you know, um, before we had this mushroom cloud of, uh, of SME companies and so on, it was, it was big governments were getting the money, handing them out to the big, big industries. And so when you've got these big industries, you can, dare I say it, pigeonhole people. You can have your mechanical engineers, you can have your computer scientists, you can have your, 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 your scientists, you know, um, and so on. Um, and so you know, it, it worked, and so the university system built up behind that, and so we have dedicated courses to mechanical engineers, to computer scientists, to, 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 to physicists, and so on. Um, but now with new space, you know, with this mushroom, uh, mushroom effect, um, with loads of SME companies coming out, um, they're looking for talent, which we here, you know, in my opinion, the, the universities here are struggling to cope with because no longer do you just want uh, a single pigeoned uh, graduate uh, with a particular set of skills. You also want them to be project managers. You want them to have uh, computer coding uh, sort of skills as well as your mechanical engineering or, or your engineering sort of degrees. So your businesses are asking for more. And so we, you know, especially here in the UK, the universities need to change. Um, and the way that we need to change is that we need industry help to provide pressure on the accrediting bodies. Uh, so, for instance, you know, you've got the Royal Mechanical uh, Engineering Society, you've got the Royal Aero uh, Sox Society. They all accredit the, the university courses. And what we need here in the UK is some sort of space accrediting body. Okay, so we can now pick and choose our courses and we can have a bit of mechanical engineering, we can have a bit of science, we can have a bit of computer science. And this is something that we're, we're missing, like a, 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 the ability to pick and mix to make a specific space courses. That's really fascinating to hear that, you know, things are developing that fast and already key skills are missing. Um, I do remember that just recently we've had the uh, space Skills Survey also published in the UK for the space sector and some of the key takeaways from that that I remember are uh, coding, uh, the expertise needed also to work in teams and project management uh, but also um, just that sort of level of um, I would say study in depth uh, at different levels and not maybe just the sort of general top level so there's a bit of a need to be a jack of all trades, if I may say the expression, but also you need to go in depth as well. well totally, and there's also this element of hands-on sort of practical um, sort of experience, which um, you know apprenticeships are, are fantastic about. But you know, there is a uh, industry is also wanting you. Know, um, and I'm sure we could talk about this a bit bit later, but wanting sort of the, this kind of experience uh, to go with there perfectly formed graduates um, and we need industry help to, to make that happen and that's something which is uh, definitely worth exploring. So it sounds like we need better communication between our industries and uh, universities and uh, higher colleges for uh, further education which is um, you know in order to meet that challenge you mentioned challenges that you use to sort of meet the technological leaps that are happening at a faster rate in the industry we're obviously obviously at the slightly more cutting edge of that in the space sector, it, uh, the challenges will be met only if we have the, the right skilled workforce to meet the challenges. Otherwise, we're going to have a disconnect. So uh, this, this is the sort of problem brewing. Um, I'd like to move on to another question um, in terms of uh, industries. Daniel, new space. Um, you know, we talk about new space as another term. What is new space? I don't want to go into that. But in terms of the work uh, and the changing environment, the whole world's just changed, of course. What do you see new space is all about in terms of the way we're working now? Well, I mean, it, it has a lot actually to do with what Peter was just saying. Um, you know, many of the, the, the teams that, that I've invested in over, over the years uh, have just, they've been university students who have just come out of university. They decided that space was really cool. Uh, they did something at university. Many of them did a CubeSat of some, some type. And they did, they did all those skills, right? They just, they just went and decided that they were going to do it, and they, and they made it happen. Um, I mean, I remember when, you know, I was doing the ISI investment. Uh, I mean, those guys just decided they were going to build a SAR, synthetic aperture radar, right? And I mean, for anyone who knows, that is really hard. Like, 
That is, that is the most hard of like radio things that you can do basically. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they just went and read all the books, some of them which were 40 years old, uh, and, and recreated all the algorithms themselves and built their own SAR from like the ground, the ground up, right? That, that is the sort of skills that we, that we need. And you do kind of only find them in these, these people who are kind of going out and confronting problems you know, like Scott does, or, and, and just going and like learning, like what are all the different applications would deal with my, my particular problem? Um, and I, I think the other thing is just, you know, how people are working differently. They are taking a lot of the tools which are common um, in, in other industries. So, you know, many of the coding techniques which are used in space are, you know, 30, 30 years old, uh, and some of them are bringing in some of those new, new tools. But then there is, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, they, they trade information a lot. Uh, which I think is a lot different from from how people used to do it. Uh, you know, within they did it within their own company, but I think people trade in information a lot across company uh, and up and down the supply chain, which I which I think is different. And I mean, you know, for anyone who's like doing any kind of DD, you know, on on any company, actually the space, you know, what DD. Sorry, we have to finish um, due academics. diligence. Due diligence. Due diligence. DD is due diligence. Everybody. Steve, Steve's like NASA forums are the right. place to go. Okay, if you want to find out about one particular like space thing, that you just go and like read those forums for a little bit. <laughs> you'll cool. be, okay. You'll be up to speed. So we have a DC talking about a DD. Thanks, Daniel. That's Thanks. awesome. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting perspective that aspect of. Um, you know, where the economy is moving, how people are adapting to the working environment. We're learning a new way of working, actually. And uh, also, there's a lot of innovation. You know, some things mm. are working, some things don't. And uh, the world's changing. Um, moving over to North America, uh, Steve, what's happening with the gig economy? It's changing also rapidly in the US, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's, it's really kind of crazy. Um, there are studies that were, came out in 2017 that said that there would be more gig workers than full-time workers by 2027. Wow. And Corona just mm. upended the, that trend and made it much faster. Uh, just last year, there was a study from MBO Partners that said there was a 34% increase in the number of freelancers last year between 20 and 21. Um, this shift is, is really a whole new mindset for working. People don't want to work for large organizations anymore. They have found that they like agency. They like to work on the things they like to work on. And the, the good news for space folks is people have a passion for space. More people want to work in this area. I think that the, the hiccup for organizations is they haven't figured out how to utilize that kind of talent. But, but on the gig side, you're seeing you know, crowds like Spacely that Tom Cook is putting together, mm -hmm. which are all people who came through the space industry that you can go hire for a project that is, you know, a two hour phone call or a three month project. And I think what we miss sometimes is it's not just the pace of change. We live in a very complex technology world and you can't actually hire all full time employees and, and be a small business. And, and be able to get all the skills you need. You just can't. And in fact, even if you're a large organization, you can't hire your way out of the rate of change because you can never onboard all the people you need because there's too many skills out there that, that are just popping up uh, left and right. And so what we're really seeing is organizations are having to restructure and rethink how they access talent. And the gig economy is popping up at just that same time. So. I think um, organizations are having to figure out how do we actually uh, put together teams that can bring in and out people uh, as needed rather than this idea of building a small team that, that will know everything they've got to know. Um, I think the other thing I would add on to this is one of the key sets of skills that is really lacking and is really bolstering the gig economy is software and data skills, uh, data science skills. And we're not seeing engineers being produced that have those skills to do model-based systems engineering, to do digital twins, to do the kinds of work that, that the leaders in this industry have to do, right? They, they, the disruptors, the ones that will win are the ones that are digital natives and they start from the beginning and that's how they're gonna go produce all the way through their life cycle. Um, and so many companies are, still have staff that don't get that. 
and and I would say universities are dropping the ball here. Mm, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, but but I think um, that model we are not we don't have managers in place that understand software and data science, and we don't have engineers that understand data science to the quantities we need. Um, if you go look at the new models that are coming out in industry, um, you know there's there's a bank in China Ant Financial that that is just blowing away all the other models. And it's 9,000 employees that service three quarters of a billion customers. And almost all of those employees aren't bankers, they're data scientists and software engineers. We've got to change the way we're thinking about how we put our teams together and staff, because when we go into space, the secret is going to be automation. And, and automation is going to lie in a bunch of software and a bunch of uh, machine learning and AI. The future is data. and. Um... Yes, it's uh, an interesting uh, aspect, and uh, it's interesting to hear that some of those key skills, key areas uh, were lacking. The growth, apparently, is in the, the downstream and the data from the space sector. This is what uh, a lot of uh, reports and analysis were looking into in the last five years, actually. So we have uh, our sectors divided classically into two halves. Uh, the upstream, which is the satellites, the launch vehicles, and the ground segment, Effectively, it's like a, a power station. I make the analogy to a power station producing electricity, which is the data or the downstream. What does the data mean? It's telecommunications, it's Earth observation data, it's weather data, it's data from sensors on satellites in low Earth orbit. It's how we use this data that's going to be critical for not just us going into space, but also the health of the planet and all of the uh, uh, things we're looking at in the upcoming... Uh, COP uh, meeting that we will have in Scotland. So data-driven analytics is a key area for skills, is a key area for the growth and uh, future um, health of the industry. Um, moving in terms of uh, how we're going to move with the times, uh, obviously things are changing a lot more rapidly. Daniel, standards and the way that we test things, you, you have a particular interest in the way consumer electronics work and how they um, may or may not be applicable in the space industry. Can we have your thoughts on what your thinking is? Can we, can we just throw consumer electronics into space? Do we have to worry about the standards that things are being made to with this rapid research and development and increased emphasis on manufacturing? Do we, do we accept failure much more, or should we be more conservative? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I th yeah, I've got a few different perspectives. Uh, I mean, one of them actually starts from where Steve was, was saying, you know, about, about taking consumer electronics. I mean, uh, it is, and then wrapping software around it, you know, it is trying to uh, achieve scale, right? And if you look at, you know, many of the systems that are being built now, you know, even in defense, right, they're basically saying, how do I take really dirt cheap telecoms components and wire them up and produce something which is like defense quality, okay? And, and that, that is a big trend. You, you hear that, you know, guys like Kinetic and, you know, they're, they're trying to put like really top secret stuff on things and, and that's the approach they're taking because of the skills issue plus because of the cost, right? Uh, and trying to get these things where you have some sort of new capability at a cost which couldn't be achieved, achieved before and also at scale because, you know, a few very precisely engineered systems aren't, aren't going to, work great if A, someone blows them up or, or they blow up on the launch pad, right? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, going back to what kind of what is Industry 4.0, it is, it is this repeatability and, and achieving that, you know, at scale is, is, you know, a really hard challenge from an engineering perspective. Um, and, you know, it kind of leads to a couple of other trade-offs. You know, do we, do you, do you simulate, like we do, you know, the space industry does a lot of testing, right? To historically, like tested, completely the end and then back again, right? And, and, you know, for those really big systems, that was possible and you had years and years and years. Well, you know, now when you're looking at kind of these middle number type systems, okay, where you've got like tens or thirties or like a hundred, how do you get testing regimes which, you know, the customer accepts is, you know, you covered off enough risk, but there's risk which are, are still remaining and, and you're fine with that, right? Uh, because you know some of them are going to are going to fail, and, and and that's okay. And and I think that you know, all all of that understanding of of where that is, uh, and what that acceptable risk level, I don't think is communicated across the industry 
that, that well yet, or at least it's not homogenous. I think it leads to interesting discussions, you know, particularly at OSS or you know, some of the other companies I'm on where it's like, you know, how do we tell the customer that it is, it is safe enough, it is going to work, right? Uh, and, and that's a particular um, you know, issue. And then you've got a lot of other, uh, other manufacturing techniques coming along like 3D printing. You, know, you just look at 3D printing for rocketry, right? You know, Rocket Labs was probably the first one who was doing all 3D printed you know, engines. Now we've got Rocket Labs, we've gone to you know, SpaceX, who's got everything you know, 3D printed. Now we've got Relativity Space, who's you know, 3D printing an entire rocket ship in the space of what, seven years? Like, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're going up the technology generations pretty, pretty quick. Uh, and, and really understanding, you know, for 3D printing, I'm, I'm not even certain about all the quality, you know, acceptance on the ground, right, for, for a lot of stuff. And how that applies to space is, you know, I still think is um, a particular issue. So there's lots of unknowns there. And if you take that thought a bit further, we're talking about going into low Earth orbit, manufacturing all of these uh, new environments that we're talking about. How do we manage the quality and the manufacturing of the hardware going into space? Who, who's going to certify a made in space component? How are we going to assemble those and make sure the quality is fit for purpose? And also, what requirements are we going to test those against? Can, can we test in orbit or, or do we have to relinquish some testing to say it's been made in orbit and it should work or do we have to test in orbit? These are quite challenging questions for a, quite a young uh, space sector actually and uh, they're going to be confronting us as we move into the moon Mars uh, activities uh, in the very near future and I think it's very interesting just focusing on those standards. It's going to be difficult to convince a company to perform at cost and also look at clients because it's a difficult relationship, this risk versus quality, risk versus reward, and, and think, also reliability. In terms but it comes of, back uh, to like what Steve said, right? It comes back to different management principles and organization type, type techniques, right? I mean, the thing that you just mentioned, 3D printing, I mean, aerospace has that problem now, right? You 3D print a landing gear, how do I know that was like 3D printed to the right standard with the right material and has the right performance, okay? But then you look at, you know, Lockheed's new generation of factory in Florida is rope. There's no fixed assembly line. There's no jigs, right? They are, you know, fully articulated robots that migrate around the, a big empty warehouse and produce stealth fighters. <laughs> that's, that's where we're going. Fascinating. Scott, we're going to move over. Go ahead, Steve. Go on. Well, I just want to add on a couple of things there. The, you talk about testing. The great thing is that we're starting to use these, these component technologies that are, are actually in use and in development across every industry. So this problem actually is not going to get solved by the space industry. It's going to be solved by the other 42 industries that are mm -hmm. all doing 3D printing in critical spaces, and it's going to be solved quickly. The other thing is testing is quickly moving to cloud simulation for a bunch, right? Look at, look at self-driving cars. They're not putting a ton of self-driving cars out in the real world, they're running a bunch of different cases in the cloud. Um, and I think there are lessons to be learned in both of those uh, for the industry uh, before we go off and spend a, a bunch of money like we have traditionally. Now you've got to do some of that, but- Steve, but I, take your I, I take your point, Steve, but I'm gonna challenge Scott now. You're gonna be building <laughs> orbital farms, okay? So you yeah. wanna build off planet, and how do we know those materials are fit for purpose? And we can't simulate everything to make sure it's going to be, be right. So what's your answer to Steve there to say, don't worry about that, that'll sort itself out. How are you going to build your orbital farm, Scott, if you don't have a regime to test against? I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, a, it's not a binary decision. It's, it's a both decision. So, you know, the way that we think about these projects is we build digital assets for, we build, we build digital tones of each of the different components, connect those with the sensors of every one of those components and, and utilize software, the digital tone world to, that, that's used to simulate tipping down manufacturing and, and, and understand what the optimal time is understand that maybe a failure is going to happen or because of the, the incredible data detail the sensors. So that's a, that's a, base underlying component that's required in every operating system. And, and to go back to uh, uh, Daniel's earlier, just around 
Um, how do you have to put that reliability in the situation if, if something is manufactured? Who carries that risk? And, and the reality is in the commercial sector, the individual companies are going to be the ones that are going to provide that guarantee. If I'm going to work with an external partner that's saying that they're going to be able to deliver water on the lunar surface, I'm going to depend on them and I'm going to secure a guarantee of the quality of that water before I'm buying that commercial purchase. So the responsibility is going to be held by that, you know, whoever's processing water to sell it to the moon. That that framework, how the space economy is going to continue to, to, to cascade. And what that means is that individual companies can develop a significant amount of deterrent and, and systems, the, the process of the products that they're producing. It's just what we have here on Earth. It's, it's not really that different. But where the really big apps are, where we don't really have a deep understanding of you know, simulating is partial gravity. We don't, some systems are not going to function how we expect them to function in 1G, how we observe them you know, functioning in micro quantity. And, and there's a really important difference there. What, what you know, it's just even talking about 3D printing, for example, you want to build a structure. You know, what is that structure actually going to be? Really almost impossible to, to, to develop a model with enough assurances to understand all the different complexities them in, in, in partial gravity. And what we need to have are apps that are orbiting that can they can have rotating structures to simulate gravity of lunar gravity of Mars gravity. We test different manufacturing processes, capabilities of the Earth here first, and then also then validate the system in situ. There. So that's a really big gap that we're not talking about the business and uh, exploring enough. Thank you for that insight, Scott. So we hear about uh, partial gravity. It's something I've picked up on, and um, we're also interested because the environment that our hardware, our software is going to be used in is going to be changing. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on that whole environment of the supply chain from it being made, being used, and then being operated on or doing stuff in the whole ecosystem of maybe launching from Earth, being made in space and then being used on the moon in a partial gravity environment or maybe on Mars or on an asteroid or planetary body. So the environment, you know, radiation environment, the thermal environment may be very different for certain specific situations. And it may be difficult to actually find a testing regime that can actually encompass all of that. And we might get spikes of one-off failures because it may be you know, just because it was really, really cold, or it might be it was very, very high radiation because the sun was at its solar maximum. So these are more complications that are thrown into this exploration space, if I call it that, uh, challenge of, of standards, etc. cetera. Um, so interesting. Uh, moving on in terms of the rate of change of technology, uh, we've heard of that right at the beginning of this uh, talk. Dr. Peter Shaw, you are at a university. You should know all about this, the rate of change. What's happening? What's going on? I'd like to hear a little bit more about this so-called rate. Of, can we keep up? Is it a problem? Is it good? Is it bad? What, what's really going on with this rate of change of technology that's happening? Okay, well, that's a big question. Um, okay, so let me uh, let me ramble on for a bit. Um, so, uh, so you've got all these uh, you've got all these SME sort of uh, companies being produced uh, and coming out. Um, and we, as I said before, we've got these problems with with being able to to produce the right skills uh, and uh, in getting people in. Uh, and so, there's an issue uh, around. Um, with this rate of change uh, around getting our our, our students uh, in, and it's a bit more kind of you need to take a, a bit bit of a step back because there's kind of a bit of a dare I say a lack of confidence uh, coming out from from the students, or, or that's my perception. Um, that you know. The, the, 
the companies or, or, or the, the landscape is shifting uh, so much, you know, do I do this particular studies? Do I do this particular studies? Where, where do I go? Where do I, what, what skills do I need? And so on. And so there is um, ever increasing kind of uncertainty um, and almost like a dip of confidence in the students which are, which are being produced. Um, and so this is a real kind of opportunity where companies can get back reinvolved uh, in, in, into, the, uh, into it all by, you know, the, there's the usual sort of conversations about mentorship, um, the internships, placements, coming down for mentoring and talks and so on, all really good stuff. But if I was to give you a, 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 like a key message to take away is that... Um, you really need to invest in the undergraduate projects, okay? So most universities will have between about 50 to 150 pounds for each of the students to do their undergraduate project. That's not a lot of money when you're looking specifically about STEM sort of subjects, you know, generating skills. But from a company perspective, if you were to sink in 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 pounds a year to help a particular space course at a particular university, that money okay, can be really used to high effectiveness um, to um, give students really interesting projects which would hopefully then lead into future interviews and, and, and employment at later stages. And from a 50 quid budget, it goes to a 300 quid budget or 400 quid. And now we're talking about something that university students can really make a difference, get a good project under their belt and have something to talk about in an interview uh, setting with, with your new space companies. And from your perspective, I assume a few thousand pounds is, is a drop in the ocean, okay? For us universities, that would make a huge bit of, uh, huge impact. And so that's what I would, I would kind of uh, suggest as a, as a solution there. Mm. Steve, the labor challenges in the market, obviously things are quite different around different parts of the world. It's very geographical, of course. What's going on in your perspective in terms of any of the challenges of matching those students and also the skills and the supply chain of the workforce coming through and, and some of the employers, are there any disconnects there in terms of, I don't know, uh, we, we hear a lot about maybe the job descriptions are maybe not ideal, sure. expectations are quite difficult to match. Uh, what's your experience, Steve? Yeah, no, I think we're going through a huge shift in the matching mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're putting out people with kind of point solution skills which is an old model. Uh, we, we need to be moving into a lifelong learning model where we're teaching students how to learn and how to synthesize and how to get the resources that they need, that they don't need to know it all, but they need to actually be able to go and put those things together. Um, and, and we're seeing that matching kind of happen more and more in the gig economy, right? You, you, if you go to a Spacely or to a Car OIO or to an Upwork, there's machine learning that is leveraging the digital exhaust of those workers. So looking at not just what their, their two-page resume says, but a record of everything they've learned for the detail and everything they've experienced, and using that to match them to projects, not nebulous jobs. And that, that more specific data-rich algorithmic-based match is starting to drive things in really interesting ways um, I'll just give you an example. ROIO is, a, is an accounting uh, uh, crowd, but they machine match uh, their actual folks with AI, but they do it in a way that, that they match people to very specific tasks in a way that that person has to act. They know about how to do that task, but they're not practiced in it. So by the time they finish that task, they're upskilled. And so they're starting to use machine intelligence to continually upskill people so that your workforce is constantly learning new things, reinforcing new areas, actually uh, getting to do things that they wouldn't normally do. Um, we're also seeing the challenge uh, platforms as a, as a place where people are going to learn and get their hands on, on projects because there is a, a zero consequence failure environment. Think about that for a second. I can go work on a challenge to build something and I can learn all about it. And if I fail, the only thing I've lost is my time. Where else in the world can you 
have no consequence failure. And if you want to innovate, that's what you need is to be able to fail without consequence. But if you work for someone or you're in school, there are consequences if you fail. And, and I think that's really limiting our innovation. So those are kind of worked out a little bit more than you asked there, but uh, hopefully that was uh, so partially. It, it should be part of the learning experience to fail. We should learn. It's an advantage also to fail because that's how we innovate and our cultures need to adapt to that. Um, Peter, we had a bit of a coffee uh, chat the other day and uh, you've got some issues regarding some of the PhD funding. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so, um, so like I answer, uh, asked the question earlier, um, there's, a, there's a real issue with funding in, in, in the UK. Um, I won't go into a huge amount of details with it, but effectively space technology PhD funding is almost non-existent, okay? I've got three PhD students at the moment, they're all self-funded. Um, there's, there's an issue with the funding bodies, um, the, you know, the UK Space Agency is very cautious about doing multi-year funding, and traditional places like the Engineering Council and so on, you need to be dual purpose uh, to get any sort of PhD funding for, for space activities. It must also have some sort of terrestrial aspect to it as well. So we're in a position, especially here in the UK where funding for PhDs is, is quite direct and so you know PhD funding is only about 75 to 100 grand um, for over a four-year period you know and you get some really good innovation IP and so if there was a message that I would send out to you it would be contemplate directly funding PhD uh, students and there's another other issue. It's not just PhD funding. It's, it's all about this okay to fail, which we just clearly mentioned. I mean, universities are great for the students to, to fail, you know, and they still get good learning out of it and so on. But one area which we really kind of um, have issues with is the whole kind of funding cycle. You have to put in a proposal for a particular bit of research, okay? And that proposal has got to be written, lots of tick boxes and, and check boxes and everything. And it's done in such a way that the proposals can't fail once you've do the work, okay, it's almost inevitable what the results of that bit of funding is going to be. And if you really want to innovate, if you really want to push, you've got to change that because um, take, for example, Horizon 2020 gives out about 5.5 billion in funding and there's about 1.4 billion um, used to actually uh, write the proposals and stuff um, in the first place. A huge waste. What could we do better with that 1.4 billion? So we've got to look at different ways of, um, of funding, um, funding new innovations, maybe something through the, the tax system, um, maybe something um, through a, a democratized way of, of funding. Scott um, just recently gave me a really interesting paper where you, where you kind of distribute the funding, you know, everybody gets a bit of funding and then you have to give half, away, half of it away to other people. Um, but from here, from this particular forum where we're focused on businesses and so on, we need to create mechanisms where there's a more, there's a, there's a closer connection between business and universities and perhaps reinvent or, or evolve the way funding bodies work because from my perspective as an academic, um, they are, uh, I'm going to get into trouble here, um, but they are a real choke. Um, on innovation. There's loads of ideas out there, but only a really small subset actually get funding. And there's a load of ideas and potential which could have been uh, funded by businesses, in my opinion. Well, uh, hopefully today you've seen some fascinating insights into you know, what we call Space 4.0, the innovation challenges, the rate of change, what's going on. It's uh, obviously a big concern for our growth of the space sector. So I'd like to end this session and move on to a Q&A if we do have any Q&A from the audience or online. Is our system broken for what we're about to face with the challenge for the space industry, or is it okay? It's kind of an interesting point to end on, but are we stoking up trouble for that exploration, those activities that we want to do in the space sector? Are we fit for purpose to do it? Over to you. One question. So we have one question from the virtual audience. It says, how do you see companies like Redwire Space with their ISRU technology fit into this new space 4.0 age? 
So lots of acronyms there. So we have Redwire, which is a company, the ISRU, which is the in situ resource utilization fitting into f space 4.0. Um, Scott, I think that's one for you. Over to you, Scott. <laughs> so I, I think Redwire is a, a great example. So they, they've roll up companies um, that are focused in ISRE type of technologies. So Maiden Spaces is, is, you know, the memorable and, and notable company. Um, so what they're doing is developing, uh, or they, they already have developed, um, and have a 3D printer on the space station. They have the capability of recycling and reusing materials. Um, and, and so they are working even on developing an architecture that can print large structures in space that you can do part of the satellite manufacturing in lower Earth orbit. Um, so I, I think things like the wire are a massive role in, in the, the, the consolidation of some of these technologies for a bigger purpose and for, uh, for gaining more access to capital, I think are, are great strategies to be able to grow the entire sector uh, overall. So I think the answer, it sounds like a great opportunity there. Go ahead, yes. Customers tend to want another one of the same, with the same testing regime, the same materials, because they want to reduce risk all the time. Uh, that, that's kind of my experience. Um, do, with the increasing use of consumer electronics, you were alluding and delivered, uh, developing the argument about reducing testing uh, approaches. I mean, it, it'll all help reduce cost, uh, of course, and improve access to space that's what it's all about really but do you not imagine that there's a risk that will end up deferring the testing to in orbit and we'll see increase an increasing number of failures in orbit which would then have other far more serious consequential problems so the question is how do you see the balance of risk between what 4.0 is all about industrialization materials lowering cost, delete high rel, insert consumer, all of those things. How do you balance that against the risk of satellite failures in orbit? That's a very good point. And um, I, I think I'd just like to take issue with you uh, on one point. It's not necessarily industry f uh, space 4.0 is necessarily reducing the reliability of some of the components. So I maybe could challenge you on that. But I, I see where your argument's going. I think... Um, you know, I don't think you'll find one case fits all and it's going to be difficult to actually look at that in detail for the, the very broad sector of what the space industry is. And as we go into these different environments, that challenge of what do you accept as failure, what do you accept as risk is going to be challenged. And those commercial decisions are going to really affect the supply chain. Um, you know, you could completely ruin the supply chain if you have, you know, some really bad failures and you could lose confidence in the sector and then you lose your investors. Um, but equally, you know, you could be over-conservative and you could lose the opportunity there as well. So it's, it's a difficult balance. Um, Daniel, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I think there's a few different um, ways to look at it. Uh, so, you know, historically... You know, these were really big individual systems, right? <clears throat> and then SES is probably the first company that, that I know of, right, which really began to produce, like, satellites in bulk. And they were the ones for, for digital TV. Uh, and they go to the geo, the geo belt, right? Um, and, and for them, you know, getting funding for the first several was, uh, you know, that was difficult. Uh, and, and the lady who started that is, is pretty amazing to, to have, you know, done that. Uh, and then, you know, we started to have a certain cadence of, of launch, right, to get those up there, and it became a kind of a more regular, regular thing. And, yeah, they had some failures, but that was, that was insurable. Um, and, you know, there was a big insurance industry which was developed on, on the top of that, right? So, so, I mean, I look at those systems kind of as, you know, a function of the launch and, and the price of each one of them and how many there are and the underlying kind of business, business case that, that you have. So, you know, you kind of alluded to other types of structures. So, you know, in LEO, low Earth orbit, 
um, <clears throat> where, yeah, so let's say, you know, we have Starlink with 12,000 or 50,000 or whatever X number of thousand of um, satellites they're, they're going to produce, right? And they, what, they, they have a launch and they shove them out like 60, 60 at a time. Um, un undoubtedly, some of them are going to not even work, right, from, from shoving out of the spacecraft. That's fine because they've designed that into their overall orbital or architecture. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, they've continually moved down their, their orbit such that, you know, there is some sort of self-cleaning uh, of, of those satellites that, that do fail. Um, and, you know, for others who are doing, you know, constellation design, uh, so, you know, as I was Seraphim, I looked at this problem in the context of investing in deorbit. You know, when Rob was here earlier, he said, we, you know, at Seraphim we never invested in launch. Well, that's because uh, we, we decided that um, there was going to be a few of these launch providers who are going to be quite big and in regional, regional areas. And then we thought that there would have to be this in-orbit thing which would move around. And it would have to go around and, and both release spacecraft. And, it, it, you know, it looked energetically too difficult to be able to, to move with a single rocket to go and put things in different orbits that constellations would require. You had to have something that would sit there in orbit for a while, right, until the right time to move, uh, you know, your orbit would, would be. Um, so, so that was the first sort of element where I could see a bit of space real estate that someone else paid for, okay, and you had other business cases that kind of, kind of grew up out of it because someone paid for that moving thing to be there, right, and then it, it's now paid for, it's free, okay, you could host like cameras on top of it, you could host like, you know, uh, other communication modules, radar, other, other things, and it was there in orbit, okay, and it had a motor and, and, and so on. So you begin to get these other kind of business type use cases that you would have. I mean, out beyond, I think it's like, I don't know what the magic number is, five, 520 or, or something, you don't get that self-cleaning type mechanism, and you will need something that will go around and, and move stuff out of orbit. Very, that's very hard, right? That is very, very hard, which I think is why we're seeing lots of people. I think most of orbits that are going to be contested are the ones below that level, which have some sort of self-cleaning. And now the big, the big thing is probably like very low Earth orbit satellites, right? Who actually have a motor which feeds on the, the atmosphere, and they look like planes, right? They actually fly through the atmosphere at a, at a high level, and if okay. they fail... I'm going to have to it. slow you down because uh, obviously we uh, are at risk of uh, annoying our uh, next host uh, for the next session. So thank you for the question. I hope the long answer uh, does explain some part of that. And hopefully today you've gained an insight into uh, Space 4.0, what it means, the risk, R&D, and what that means for our future for manufacturing. And thank you for all our panel members, the audience, and our online audience as well. And have a great conference, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.